Ladies and gentlemen, the chess world has a new villain. Alternatively, the chess world has a new hero. Whatever you want to call him. His name is Nodirbek Abdusatorov. And he is from Uzbekistan. Nodirbek has been at the top of the world rankings, top 10, top 15, top 20, for several years now. He's one of the up-and-coming, promising junior players. In fact, Nodirbek is the second youngest person on planet Earth to win a World Chess Championship. He did it several years ago in the World Rapid, which he won at the age of 17. Youngest person to ever win any World Championship is Hoi Fan, who won the Women's World Championship at the age of 16. Nodirbek is a beast. He is the Uzbek Tiger. And over the last couple of weeks, he won a tournament and became the fourth highest rated player in the world. Higher rated than Ding Li Ren, the current world chess champion. In this video, I'm going to show you multiple ridiculous games that Nodirbek has played, multiple queen sacrifices, gangster moves left and right. This dude is a problem. And he is such a problem he is the first junior to become higher rated than Ali Reza Firuja. Ali Reza Firuja, you might remember if you are a chess fan, was the youngest person to cross 2800. Since then, he has fallen down, and Nodirbek, from the modern generation of junior players, is the first one to overtake Ali Reza. So, Nodirbek was playing in the Prague Masters, which is a tournament for Masters that was held in Prague. Just watch these games. All right, Nodirbek won a, a, a multitude of games in a variety of different methods. I, th this is really just, it's just badass stuff. So he opened a game with E4. This is the second round of the event. Uh, and his opponent is David Navarro, one of the strongest players in the Czech Republic. In fact, I think the highest rated player in the Czech Republic. Uh, it started out with an Italian, Bishop C5, C3, Knight F6, D3. This is a very, very, very popular setup for white. It is the main line, defending the center, maybe preparing a queenside expansion, slowly preparing D4, black plays D6. Nodirbek right away attacks the queenside, threatening to trap black's bishop. Now, that is not where the game ends. David Navarro plays A5, B5, the knight is pushed back, and now Nodirbek plays knight BD2, and both sides castle. And... The meta of the position will be determined by the center pawns. If either side can expand, if black can create counterplay with the C pawn, we're about to find out. The knight rotates to the center. And now immediately, Nodirbek opens fire on the center of the board. Take, take. And here comes Navarro right back with pawn to d5. Take, take. So white is left with an isolated center pawn, a solo standing pawn. Uh, there is a smudge on my monitor on the C3 square. You can't see me cleaning it, but I am cleaning it right now. Uh, and basically, white is going to put his pieces around that center pawn and try to pressure the black position with the following moves, queen b3 and rook e1. You see Navarro defending himself. I did say that that move was going to happen. I really like this move from David Navarro, just planting the knight on the b4 square. However, white now plays knight e4, and the pawn cannot be captured because after knight takes d4, queen takes d4, White would play bishop b2 with a monstrous attack on the black king. For example, if queen here, you would play queen c3, and there is actually no way to stop checkmate, because f6, you would hang your king. Knight e5 delays checkmate indefinitely, but definitely it will happen. So, yeah, you can't do that. So we have pawn takes b5, a takes b5, and here we go. Nodirbek is beginning the active operations onto the f7 pawn. Nodirbek is a menace of an attacker. He is so good at coordinating his pieces. Look at this. Every single piece he has is involved in the attack. Every single one. They're all doing something. The bishops are pressuring on the diagonals. The knights are standing over here. You may ask yourself, why is black not playing h6? Because white is just going to go here. Like, white is just standing around waiting to make this move. And then once black were to capture, the rook would no longer protect that rook. So you would go here. And every single piece is involved in the game. Literally every piece Nodirbek has, has a role in the attack. So bishop a3, rook d8, David Navarro down 25 minutes as he's trying to defend himself. Nodirbek captures the knight and puts this knight on the c5 square. Now things heat up, all right? Of course, when you analyze Grandmaster games with a computer, the computer says, well, obviously just queen takes d4, and then after knight takes f7, you play rook c8, and then if bishop d3, you have rook takes f7, like... 
The computer kind of finds a way to kill the allure, but if I turn off the evaluation bar and you just have to defend this position with black, as your opponent swarms you from both sides of the board, snipes you down the middle and on the side, ready to get in with the rooks, it's a problem. It's a very problematic position, which is why David Navarra isn't able to defend it perfectly. Rook c1, counterplay is created, and now the position explodes. Nodzirbek plays bishop takes f7 check. Now, that bishop is not touchable because if you take it, you walk into a pin. And you can't have that because white has the backwards knight jump, knight to d3. With an attack on the queen, pressure on the rook, and then you're just going to take the knight because the queen is what we call overloaded. The queen cannot protect both pieces at the same time. So, the king goes to h8. And if we just take a moment, we pause here, we count the pieces. Two bishops and a knight, two knights and a bishop. No jailbreak is only up a pawn. What's the big deal? Well, now he rotates his queen over. The big deal is he's got eyes over here. He's going to try to get onto the king side as well. Black plays h6. And now this is just a gross move. I mean, what Nojirek plays here, just knight takes b7. Taking away another pawn from his opponent and attacking his queen. Now here, knight e2 check is a crazy move. If you take with the rook, you lose defense of this rook and you get mated. If you take with the queen, you lose defense of the knight. And that's exactly what happens. But now Nojirek plays rook c6. This is crazy. The knight is hanging, but you can't take the knight. If you take the knight, it's check, it's here, and I play bishop g6 and you just lose. You just get mated. You can't take the knight. So, watch this. Bishop takes d4, Nojibek gets the king out of the diagonal, and now we have rook takes f7. And in this position, Nojibek shows the entire idea that he had up his sleeve. Right now, he's down a piece. Nojibek is down a full knight. Right, he lost one of his knights. And if he takes this, after this, black has two bishops for a rook and a pass pawn. This is just a winning position for black. So what did Nojibek have up his sleeve in this position? Well, in this position, in all this chaos, Nojibek finds rook to d6. Hanging the rook. The idea of rook d6 is nasty. It is simply, if you take the rook, your back rank is cleared and it's mate because my knight, which is hanging, but you haven't taken yet, protects and doesn't let your king get out. The reason why that couldn't just work right away is because if you played queen e8 check, which looks like mate, I come back with my rook and my rooks protect each other. I don't take your rook. If I take your rook, then it's checkmate. Then it's rook takes and rook takes. So rook d6 disconnects the position. This is still a problem. Queen e8 is a problem. David Navarro thinks for a bit, plays rook c8. Now we take, because now we get the bishop. And the dust settles, and in this insane tactical skirmish, it is Nodjerbek emerging. The pawn gets to b2, the pawn gets to b7, but unfortunately, white's pawn is much stronger. And uh, David defends himself, the rook comes back to d1, that pawn's not going anywhere, and that's it. You win the pawn, you're promoting your own. What a win, all because of this move, rook to d6. An absurd move. Rook d6 cut the circulation, cut the communication of the black position, setting up threats of queen e8 mate. If you played bishop b6, I would have played takes, takes, I would have mated you. And if you played after rook d6, h takes g5, I would have played rook d8, and when the king came up, I would have mated you like this, which is absolutely brutal. Nodjerbek finds rook d6 disgusting. Absolutely disgusting. But... At this level, you also have to be able to win with the black pieces. And let me just show you. I mean, the show that Nojirek put on in Prague was ridiculous. He went for Sicilian. He tried to win every game. The dragon, the accelerated dragon, is absolutely not something that we see anymore at the top level of chess. It's just not. It's because there's a lot of other things that you can play with black where you get an okay position, but Nojibek is a hundred points higher rated than his opponents. He wants to win every game. He thinks he's the best player. Knight a5, right? This is a peaceful dragon. The, the most aggressive way to play the dragon is to castle queenside and to go for an attack. But white plays what we call a positional dragon with short castle. Nojibek says positional smizitional, all right? Here's my rook. Here's my queenside counterplay. I'm going to put my knight on c4. I'm going to take the bishop. Here we go. Bishop g5, rook e8, solid position. Mateusz Bartel from Poland mobilizes and goes all, all in in the center. Take, take. Now, we don't take the bishop. We put the knight on c4 because we're being annoying. We're trying to attack this pawn. We're trying to get our opponent to take us. So now, for me, this is the obvious move. To pressure this, to pressure this. No. Nojirbek transforms the pawn structure. 
This now attacks the queen and it restricts the pawn movement. And when the B pawn becomes a C pawn, the B file becomes open. We don't care that this pawn is a weakness. Queen E3, because now we are going to spend the game hunting our opponent's queen side and, and completely not worrying about this. Queen E4, Queen A2. Nodja Break says, listen, bro. If you don't want your queenside pawns, I am absolutely going to go take them. Now, Bartel says, I want to attack you. Queen h4. It's like poker. Nodjerbek takes another pawn. <laughs> He's just like, he -he, I'm just going to take all your pawns on the queen side. Queen a2, queen b2. It's really funny because White is saying, you're stupid if you take those pawns because I'm going to checkmate you. And Nodjerbek is saying, you're stupid if you let me take these pawns because you're not going to checkmate me, right? It's the beautiful thing about chess. It's just a silent communication of who's the bigger moron. That's really what it is, right? So, bishop takes c7. Now Nodjerbek says, I'm not locked in here with you. You're locked in here with me. Now you can't get out. Good luck putting a bishop on f6, because then I'm going to trade the rooks, destabilize your center, and then I'm going to disconnect your queen from the defense of this and this. Right? Your queen can't guard everything. So h6. Bartel plays queen f4. Nodjerbek, if I told you from this position... Nojebek wins this game in five moves. Five moves from this position. Okay, I understand you see the eval bar, you think black is better, but it's just like Bartel was completely fine from the opening. I mean, the position is just balanced. But people get so uncomfortable playing Nojebek that they try to make something happen, right? They just kind of want an out, like in a fight. Fighters always say, like, people want out of a fight. And, and when Nordjebek puts this pressure on you, you kind of just want to make something happen, just to clash and see what occurs, right? Bishop takes e7, queen f4. Nordjebek goes here and just says, give me the last pawn. Bartel jumps into c6. And Nordjebek says, you know what? Take, take, and take. Everything in white's position is gone. All the pawns are gone. Black is going to win the pawn on c2. Black also just has a pass pawn. He just has a pawn. Like, nobody's stopping that pawn clearing all the way down to a1. Bishop d6. He trades. He wins the... He won the whole queen side. Nozibek literally walked in and ate all the queen side pawns because white just decided it was better not to defend them and to go for counterplay. He makes one aggressive move on the king side. Nozibek's defense defends his back rank. Queen f3. Queen b3. All the pawns are protected, and they are just going to start marching, and Bartel resigns. How do you make it look this easy? This guy is 2660 Fide. This guy's the third highest rated player, fourth highest rated player in all of Poland. There's Wojtaszek and there's Duda, and I'm pretty sure it's Bartel. And he made it look effortless. He made it look so simple. Bartel's a great player. This is the kind, like, Nordjerbeck plays so uncompromising. He's just trying, he's playing a dragon. The Dragon Sicilian is not seen at top level. It's a great opening, but it's not seen at top level because it's a little bit too risky. It's a little bit too provocative. Nope, not for Nojibag. Now, he had another game with Black. This game was ridiculous. This, okay, Bartel, 2660, in his 30s, I think you could say, oh, he's the old generation. You know, all these young guys now, they're a big challenge for each other. Yo, here's a game between Nojibag and Vincent Keimer. These dudes are six rating points apart on the official list. Vincent Keimer is the same age as Nojibag. These guys are peas in the same pod. They are the same generation. Nojibag shows up and plays the Queen's Gambit accepted. Another opening. First of all, no one at top level is playing d4, d5. They're all playing knight f6, e6, looking for a Nimso Indian, ready to defend against the Catalan. Nojibag says, you're not getting any of that. I'm taking the Gambit. You are playing on my terms. Now, the most peaceful way to play this opening with white is knight f3, and then e3, and then these guys play this endgame line, and it's very solid. Yeah, but Vincent Keimer is trying to win, right? He plays e4. But you know who else is trying to win basically at all costs? This man, Nodjerbek. He plays knight c6. The main line here, the main line is e5 which is just symmetrical pawn play in the center of the board. Very solid. Nodjebek plays knight c6 and immediately gets into a wrestling match. Like, look at these pieces tangled in the center of the board. You can't take because of the pin. I'm defending my pawn. I'm going to strike at the center like this, right? Bishop e3, h3. We take, we damage the structure. We, we allow white to have this big structure and get his pawn back, but we play e5. And the point is, if you take en passant, I play queen d1. Rook d1, fe6, I'm threatening this pawn, right? You can defend it. 
then I'm gonna play bishop to b4. You can take the pawn here, but then I'm gonna take, take, then I'm gonna take. And like, Nodjebrek has insane analysis in this line that runs really deep. So e5, Vincent comes back to e2 after spending some time. Vincent spent 15 minutes. The best line was to grab the bull by the horns. Instead, we have the following position. Big structure for white, but damaged. Black doesn't have a lot of central space. Okay, so he takes queenside space. Like, Nodjebrek has one of the most uncompromising styles in chess right now. You just, you don't, you don't want to get into a big battle with him. You don't want to create this level of imbalance because he will outplay you. Vincent plays a4. Nodjebrek, what? He took? You, I mean, you give me this position. Uh, uh, 10 times out of 10, I'm playing b4. Why would I ever open up the bishop, open up the b file, open up the rook? I'm shoving this knight back. And then I'm going to castle. But Neuterbeck, he didn't like that. He didn't like shoving the knight back. Because if the knight comes back, it's going to dance to c4. And he evaluates the opening of the position as beneficial for him. I would never... I would never play this move. Why would I allow my opponent to get activity? Well, because the knight drops back, then I'm going to castle, and actually it is black who is getting activity as well. I'm telling you, Nodjebek is like a, like a give and take kind of guy. Rook g1 to attack on that side of the board, he castles right into it. The rook is staring at his king, he castles right into it and says, come and get me. You want to play bishop h6? My bishop will defend my king, you got nothing. So Vincent goes back to c2, and now Nodjebek says, a5. I'm getting out of the way of getting captured. A5. You, uh, I'm allowing the knight in. I don't care. Queen E7. Now, Vincent finds a nice idea. Knight A7 to try to get to C6. I mean, that looks nasty. The knight will exert pressure on the entire black position. And right at this moment... Nodjebek lashes out on his own. He is now trying to create an attack. What's crazy is this is just a free pawn. But you triple your opponent's pawns, who now has tripled isolated F pawns, isolated H pawn, isolated D pawn. Every pawn structure in white, in, in white's camp is isolated. Nobody has a neighbor. They are all separated. So F5 is a ridiculously deep idea. But here's the thing. If you don't do anything about that pawn, that pawn is either going to shove your bishop back or open up the position anyway. I'm telling you, uncompromising. Knight C6, the queen goes to F7. Vincent tries to advance a little bit with the h-pawn. Nodjebrek gets the king to h8, so now the king is out of the line here, out of the line of anything over here, and out of the line of the knight. Rook g5. Queen e8 slides back, opens up the rook, and defends the pawn. Now Vincent's like, you know what? I'm uncomfortable with where my king is. I'm going to run my king out of the middle of the board. h6 pushes the rook back. Now, again, I'm telling you, I don't... The moves Nodjebrek makes are so alien to me that after he makes them, I have to appreciate them. The best move in this position for black is to play a4, which gets the pawn out of the line of the knight, but it, 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 it allows it to be taken, but it can't be taken because the queen needs to protect the bishop. So after take, take, you would play take. The queen can't take because you have knight f6 and the pressure on the center is too strong. And if this, the king has to walk into the middle and then you have queen h5 check. So A4 is designed to not be taken. And if the thing is, if you don't take it, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep marching into the position, which is why Vincent decides to capture. He's down to seven minutes. He's down to seven minutes. The entire position is about to fall apart. Here comes Nodjebek. He gets in with his queen, and he's a pawn down. He's a pawn down. Where is his counterplay? His counterplay is right here. He's threatening knight c5 check. King gets out of danger. The knight goes to f6. Who's going to guard the pawn in the center? I got news for you. Nobody. Vincent down to one minute. The knight comes back to f6. This pawn is under attack. Who's going to defend it? The rook. Which means the other side of the board is going to have no defense. And he gets the pawn on f2. Bishop f2, queen f2, rook e2. We don't trade queens. Queen e4, rook f4, rook c4 check. And rook takes h4. And in this position, from up a pawn to down two, a three pawn swing in like seven moves... Vincent Keimer resigned. Nodjebrek showed up, played a queen's gambit, immediately got into a jujitsu match. Limbs are tangled in the center of the board. We go all the way down, and I mean, this is just... The ability for Nodjebrek to make controlled chaos of his games and beat a top 15 player as strong as him 
as young as him, as hungry as him, as skilled as him, it's just it's just something to be in awe of. And to get it done against the guy like Vincent Keimer like this, to just make him this uncomfortable, make him down 30, 20, 30 minutes on the clock, ridiculous. And if you thought that was impressive, this next game's gonna blow your mind. If you had the patience to sit through 20 minutes of content, now you're gonna get rewarded because I was floored at this game. I mean, I was floored at like, the Navarra game, like, again, controlled chaos is, is so rare at the 2750 chess level. They're all, they're all trying to move the wooden figures like one square for seven hours and make draws. But, oh my goodness, watch. Parham Maksudlu also, like 20, 22 years of age, unless Parham's like older now. Like sometimes, you know, years go by. You, you, you look at an athlete, you're like, they're 28? I thought they were like 20. You know, this was a Sicilian defense. So Parham showed up to fight number one ranked player in Iran, Knight or Sicilian. It doesn't get more uncompromising than this. H3, the Adams attack to try to go for G4. E5, you don't have to remember these names. It's not going to be on a test. Bishop E3, Queen F3, G4. As you can see, there we go. Right away with the uncompromising style, Long Castle. But the thing is, it's actually Parham who, who, who said right off the bat, like, I want to fight. Like in hockey, when they say I want to fight. You know, it's amazing. It's the only sport where you can fight for five minutes. Nobody touches you. I love it. I still sometimes watch highlights of the Flyers uh, Penguin series from like, God, I don't even know, 2007, 6, 8, when they just fought every game. That was the series where the Penguins would win a game by one and uh, the Flyers would win a game by like seven goals. Ridiculous. Shout out to Claude Giroux. They, I, I, Claude, Claude Giroux? Claude Giroux, I, Giroux? Is that his name? I don't know. Anyway, have some hockey knowledge, not as much as other sports. Night G6. Anyway, uncompromising style. Sides are preparing for an attack. Castles, here we go. All right? Bishop f1. Parham plays knight h4. Nojibek sneaks in this bishop capture. Pawn takes. Solid. Not allowing white any progress. Queen slides out of danger. The knight goes back to play to f4. So far, Nojibek has not gotten a chance in this game. Parham has controlled him very well. But Nojibek is resilient. He's going to keep poking. But no, Parham is now, is now making strides toward his position. It's a very, very, very tense game. Let's see if, if Nojibek's nervous system holds up. Nojibek here plays a4, which is ridiculous. You are not supposed to move pawns on the side of your own king like this, right? Parham, knight f4, rook e3. It's actually black now who has a slight advantage according to the computer. g6, trying to make progress on that side of the board. Knight comes back. Nojibek making everything solid, but if anything, it's Parham who's going to start coming down the h file. This is kind of bad. So sensing this, sensing that the position might start tilting soon to Black's favor, Nojibek fires back with his own weakness. He uses his broken arm to hit his opponent in the head. <laughs> How is that even possible? Well, the, the point is, after this, Black would be left with just floppy pawns, and then you would go here, and Black would have to play like G5, and then White would just immediately get in. So instead of that, Parham takes the knight, puts the rook back, and is ready to capture back, but this gives white time. Now that Parham is gonna do that, this gives white time. He gets the bishop to a6. Now he trades the rook because he's gonna infiltrate on the c file. Take, take. Parham takes on g5. Que I told you, infiltration on the c file. Here comes Parham's knight. Look at it dancing into the white position. This game was ridiculous. Parham's infiltrating on the h file. Someone's gonna lose. It's basically just a race against time. Rook e3, rook h2. Oh my goodness, the knight goes to f1 attacking the rook and the knight is still hanging. The knight dances out, hitting the rook, defended by the rook, which can be taken by the white knight. But if the white knight takes the rook, it stops defending its own rook, which is why we have rook c3. Knight goes to b4. So the queen is now hanging. The rook is also hanging. If you move the queen, black comes here and this is really unpleasant. But Nojebek planned all of this out. And after knight b4, he sacrifices his queen! Oh my goodness! He gives up the queen to get the pawn two squares closer to promotion. But the pawn is under wrap. Like, it can't go anywhere. But Nojebek sensed. He sensed that this was the plan. He now brings the bishop back. And his game plan, he gets extra 30 minutes because they crossed the 40 moves. It's a very common thing in chess. You're going to get rid of this knight. You're going to push this pawn. And basically, the idea is that this position is always winning for white. It's winning for white because the queen can't move. The queen can't move. The king can't move. White will now spend the rest of the game just mobilizing and taking stuff. It's very easy. So sensing that, sensing that that's going to happen, Parham blockades the pawn with the knight. That's going to be really difficult to get rid of. Nojirbek understood that. 
And so he, he, he got the fact that in a distant, distant world, all he has to do is get rid of this blockade and he has a chance to win. He is now ready and prepared to take as much risk as possible. Watch what Nojebek does. Standing completely unafraid of the Black Queen, he plays Rook C2, Bishop C4, allows Parham to come to him to get rid of that blockade. Look at that, he's gonna get rid of that knight. The knight goes to E6. Now we have B3. If the queen goes to A7, the pawn will get to C7, but, but he's ready for that, all right? In this position, queen A7 might have given black an advantage, according to Stockfish is always, always kind of ruining the parade. It would have been better here, apparently, for him to move the king first or even play G5, limiting the black king's activity. Plays B3, Parham plays knight D4. Nojebek gets the pawn to C7. That was the entire idea all along. Now the queen is ready to come in. This is very scary. Parham is going to come in with the queen, get to the king, threatening the rook. This is very, very dangerous. But I told you, Nojebek is prepared to take as much risk as possible. Rook d2, check, hide the king, queen here. What do you move? If you make a queen right now, I take, check, here, 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 and it's mate. And if you ran forward, it's just mate in one. So this is a crazy move. Nojebek goes rook h2. How on earth is white going to make progress here? Look at black. You can't take because your bishop hangs. What do you do? You still can't make a queen. Nojebek finds g5. And now, after knight takes f3, rook f2, pawn takes. This man sacrifices the rook. With a check to get this position. Bishop, knight, pawn, pawn. The black queen now has to go back, and Nordirbeck uses his pieces as a shield. You cannot give me a check, because if you run out of checks, I'm going to go bishop d7 and queen. This is so ridiculous. He finds a defensive setup where black has to find the only moves, whereas white's idea is to go here and get the bishop there and make a queen. How on earth do you stop this if you are playing with black? Queen b7, bishop, this is insane. The only defensive setup here for Parham Maksudlu, the only one, is to play king f8. Because if he plays this, which is what he played in the game, the knight now hits f6, and that matters because if the bishop goes to d7, you cannot take. Now, I know, I know what you're saying. This is check, actually. I apologize. I apologize. That was a terrible demonstration. Let's go to c4 instead. Bishop d7. You can't take with check. This is why I commentate the games and why they play them. The point is, if the king is on f8, then there is no bishop d7 because you cannot take because knight f6 check is no longer a check. So the black king has to dance 2f8 and 2g7. It's still not over because I'm going to go here. And then after king, queen c8, you, gotta, you, know, you, you still have to find all the right moves. Because I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to walk in a different way, and then Queen B7. Like essentially, the, the the defensive idea is to not allow me to get the king to be six. If I get the king to be six, I win because I, I I get the queen out anyway. That's the point. Nordirbeck creates such ridiculous practical problems for his opponent. His opponent blunders. Now we have Bishop D7. It's check. It's King B3. It's Queen B7. It's King C2. There are no more checks. You make a queen. And if you thought that was brutal, he ends this game in an even more brutal fashion. He sacrifices his queen. He did not want to deal with a queen on the board. Plays queen g8 check. Black has to take. Then he will be forked. I'm going to win the, the queen back. I'm going to take all the pawns. In this position, Parham Maksudla resigned. And those are back up to the throw. Won the Prog Masters 20 24 but ironically lost only one game and that one game was against the pride of india prague himself prague had a good event he had an up and down event 
uh, but he he won more more games than he lost, I believe. He was the only one to beat Nozirbek, but right now all eyes are on Nozirbek. He gained 12, if not more, points in this tournament, and he is now the fourth highest rated player in the world. Magnus Carlsen, Fabiano Caruana, Hikaru Nakamura, Nozirbek Abdusatorov. You talk about good company. That's crazy. And the fifth highest rated player in the world is now Dingley Ren. Nozirbek is now the only junior to surpass the rating of Ali Reza Faruja. He's the second youngest person to ever become a world champion. And he might be the new villain of chess. Or hero. Uzbekistan, you got a real one. Uh, that's all I have for you today. Get out of here.